Hello and welcome back to the trading floor. And I feel like this is a bit of a prize fight of sorts. Combine the two heavyweights, the two contenders of the mid and end of week show have uh, have met now for the first time, squaring off. That's so who's going to come out triumphant? <laughs> and any word from either of the contenders before we begin the uh, the session today? Well, I mean. I think this is where I finally get found out, isn't it? <laughs> After all, what are we on? Episode uh, 100 and something. And finally, this is where the tide goes out and everyone realises I don't have my swimming trunks on. <laughs> Again, a horrible, a horrible mental image. Um, and look, you know, we're, we're at Amplify, we're all about quantitative assessments and numbers and data and analytics and things like that. So you maybe next episode, you can you can tell us, you know, okay. which of the two podcasts gets the higher viewership. I would expect Ooh. it to be Friday because you guys are the incumbents, but I want to see what my trajectory is. I want to see when, when I, when, if and when I might kind of cross over. So look, well, look, it's all you, you're only as good as your last race. So it's all about this <laughs> conversation. And mm-hmm. at the end, what we'll do is we'll ask the community to utilize their Q&A function on spotify mm. and pass judgment it's not up to me <laughs> just just, just to be clear here. just to be clear when when the midweek deal room podcast does rise above this end of week trading floor podcast i i do get to retire then right <laughs> yeah that's absolutely a friday, perfect friday show right, that'll be next week careers, career show, <laughs> so um... this is it this is my big finale <laughs> And by the way, and you can't recuse yourself from the popularity contest. <laughs> you know, you, you've got to do a little LinkedIn poll and and juice your own juice your own numbers by just okay. voting okay. repeatedly for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, 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 there's no more Hotmail, Gmails, Yahoo Mail yeah. that I can cust- muster up anymore. <laughs> but well, look, look, let's let's jump straight in and let's talk about the main theme of this conversation, which is the first of the big bank earnings. They've literally just come out in the last hour or so, namely these being JP Morgan, City, Wells Fargo, and the world's biggest asset manager, BlackRock. And then perhaps at the end of that, we can talk about a little bit of the broader picture because it's a buy everything type of week. And I'm sure that, that Piers can uh, shed some color on why that's occurred. But yeah, let's let's kick it off then. Let's talk about, I guess, JP Morgan being the kind of beast that it is, that maybe we could start with them. Um, their revenue soared to a record in these Q2 numbers that we've just seen. Um, a lot of the press noting the boost coming from the Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes and this acquisition of First Republic Bank. Their EPS 437, Street was expecting $4, revenues 41.3 billion above expectations of 38.96. So before we look at divisions anything from the top line kind of numbers and also this idea perhaps a bit more uh color about how interest rate hikes are uh, impacting these results because i know it's not just for jp well um yeah i think that there's three words that stand out here or that are important uh those are net interest income so this is about interest rates. It's, it's really the spread between um, short-term rates and long-term rates, which is ultimately where the, the big lenders of this world, that's where they live. It's, you know, it's that spread, that's their profit margin. So it's the difference between short-term deposit rates. So the interest rate you get on your deposit account, that's how the bank, that's the source of capital for these banks. So they've got to pay for that, but they're paying low short-term rates to depositors and then of course they're taking that capital and they're lending it and they're for longer periods a mortgage being the classic example and they're able to charge a lot higher interest rate on those long-term loans and as interest rates from the central bank have been you know steeply climbing then this is get this is like perfect for these banks to exploit the growing gap between those short-term and long-term rates. And that's called the net interest income. Um, And that's JP Morgan. Uh, That has climbed to 
44%. Sorry, it's grow, it's up 44% year on year. So they've now bagged $21.9 billion in the quarter, um, just on their loan book, basically. And that's the fifth, here's the best bit. And, th and this is all about, because remember, interest rates have been going up for, well, what? Uh, I don't even know, 18 months? No, less, 15 months, is it? Anyway, this is the fifth straight quarter of double-digit growth on that net interest income figure. Um, so yeah, 21.9 billion, better than the expected 21 billion. I mean, it's not a massive surprise, but yeah, that's the standout line on this report. Uh, Piers, a, a, a bit of a question. So this spread is obviously massive, uh, and it's resulted in uh, really, really strong performance across all the banks. Is the spread uh, largest when there are quick and repeated interest rate hikes? And does it settle down once everything flattens out, even if that interest rate is at a very, at that central bank interest rate is at a very high level? Does that spread shorten and shorten as we, you know, we get more used to this higher interest rate environment? 100%. Yeah, I mean, basically, this is, remember that this interest rate hiking cycle has been the steepest hiking cycle, well, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe since the 1980s. Um, so, yeah, the more rapidly rates go up, well, then actually, this is where the banks, we talked about this, I think, a little bit on the last part, they're quite sneaky in that they will, so the interest rate on their mortgage loans, right? As soon as the central bank raises rates, like to the second, then the interest rate on your mortgage goes up. Okay, so they're, they're charging more. Um, so they're earning more on that, on that loan side of the book. But do they do the same for their savers and their depositors? No. So they're very slow. To then see, you know, to tweak up their deposit rates. So the faster the interest rate hiking cycle, the more they can exploit that lag, if you like. And look, and I think actually on top of that, I mean, because we'll talk about you can, well, Stephen, I'll let you dig into some of the the nitty gritty here. But if with JP Morgan, one other stat um, as an example was their um, low, um, sorry, their deposits uh, increased by 1% on the quarter to $2.4 trillion, right? Now, what's gone on here is that obviously the Silicon Valley Bank thing has, generally speaking, been one catalyst that's led to deposits coming out of the smaller banks where there's perceived higher risk and being moved to bigger banks where there's lower risk, right? The other catalyst it, for the banking system generally has been the fact that they're slower increasing the rates on savings accounts. So you've seen some depositors go, you know what, well, screw you. I'm not sitting here waiting until you decide to put your rate up whenever that might be. I'm pulling my money out and I'm going to put it into a money market fund or, you know, and we'll talk about BlackRock later. They've benefited from this actually. But JP Morgan, because they're the big boys, so therefore the perceived safest, um, they've actually seen deposits increase during this time. Um, and I think they're being bullies. I mean, the smaller banks, they're having to raise their interest rates on their savings accounts to try and stem the outflow, right? So actually, if you if you put your money in a smaller bank, you, you're going to get a decent uptick on your savings rate. But if you want the safety, then you give up that higher savings rate. And so JP Morgan have really benefited from this Silicon Valley bank uh, shift and the perceived risk around depositors. So yeah, this all feeds into that another big double digit growth on their um, net interest income. Cool. And then just looking at the the other main divisions then on the breakdown. So the way that the results come out for JP, it's they've got markets and they've got banking. If you're looking at their like earnings presentation, so on the banking side, they had revenues of twelve and a half billion up four percent year on year uh, the ib revenue of one and a half billion was up 11 percent ib fees were down six percent is this to be expected we're kind of aware of the climate at the moment was there anything in in those numbers that surprised you Stephen? i guess it surprised the upside 
these are really not particularly bad numbers considering if you read the averaged article about deal making deal volumes ipos investment bank fees we're talking down 20 30 40% across the board in 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 h1 so the fact that jp morgan's even even the cyclical nature even the volatile nature of this of this division it's not struggling as much as its peers so uh, you know this is the earnings report where everything seems to be falling into place for jp morgan you know it's it's taking as you said it's taking deposits from smaller banks there's a flight to safety there's massive massive uptick from net interest income and the very volatile section is is not is not it's not going down nearly as much as its peers. So, you know, I think we're going to talk about City later on, but I think his, its investment banking fee revenue is down 44%. Right. So, yeah, you know, IB fees down 6%, you can take that. Yeah. And you just think, you know, I'm thinking to myself, all right, what is the perfect conditions for a global bank to make money? Okay, a high interest rate environment without a recession, so there are lots of loan provisions. We can talk about that, but there's not a lot of defaults at the moment. The IPO market's opening back up. The M and A market's opening back up. So we're kind of we're almost at this point where you think, all right, if I was to create the perfect scenario under which JP Morgan can thrive, probably about today <laughs> is, as, is, is as good as it gets. So if they're missing earnings on today, then you know you've got you've got to be worrying. But obviously they didn't. They smashed it. You got, I mean, and also you got to throw in, I saw they've benefited from a, a $1.8 billion gain relating to their first Republic deal. So I mean, yeah. this is the biggest, being the biggest player in the last quarter. Yeah, as you say, coupled with the macro scenario and the monetary policy backdrop. Yeah, this is yeah. optimum. We spoke about it on the pod of few weeks ago that that first republic deal could only go through jp morgan aren't allowed to make bank acquisitions because they're too big un unless there is a distressed circumstance so it's just like how lucky can you be you know you pick something up on the cheap and you get a two billion dollar kind of kickback <laughs> uh, that is going to boost your kind of uh, unadjusted bottom line so yeah look but just maybe just a step back i was just looking at its price earnings you know, it's pretty, you think double digit uh, revenue growth over the last five quarters or, or whatever you said, Piers. On the net income side, yeah. On the net income side, yeah, on the net income side. You, you're thinking that's kind of tech levels of growth, right? You know, whenever you hear double digits, you're thinking price earnings multiples of 30, 40 times. And obviously, banks are different, but the uh, you know JP Morgan's price earnings is what, 11, 12 times, something like that? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's still... <laughs> it's still, although we've got all of these amazing numbers, it's still a bank and it's still cyclical and it's still subject to so many different external uh, forces that it's not going to ever kind of break out of that moderate price earnings uh, level. So, so Anne, I've got a question for you. If you were Jamie Dimon, surely this is where you, this is like the mic drop moment. Oh, you just walk out the door into the sunset, don't you? And then still time to get in the race for the 2024 yeah. presidency. <laughs> no? Could quite possibly be the case. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, he. I, I did note a comment that Diamond did say. He, he quote said, consumer balance sheets remain healthy. Consumers are spending, albeit a, a little more slowly in terms of the pace. Labour markets have softened somewhat, but the job growth remain strong so yeah i mean that sounds pretty positive to me with like, hearing him say that so one question then to wrap jp was on the markets side mm. when you're looking at these percentages um i guess peers is this more a case of well you've got to look at the world and where we were this time last year so when you hear market revenues are down 10 percent year on year fixed income market revenues are down three percent equity market revenues down 20 percent year on year is that because second quarter in the prior was so strong? So it's just that it makes yeah. this look more difficult. In the well, current. no, this is this is about trade volumes. I mean, um, 
I didn't know the split out. I knew that together the fixed income and equity trading divisions together were down 10% year on year. Still a cool $7 billion, mind, but um, but I didn't realize when you split it out, the equity side was down 20%. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is just, yeah, well, there's, there's some kind of tricky year on year comps here because obviously if you go back to the, the first part of 2022 this is where you know we had some big big volumes as markets were coming off and coming under pressure and the rate hiking cycle had started to really ramp up and inflation was out of control and what that led to was a lot of um well just a lot of trading right this is where asset managers are going well hang on a minute we're having a real shift in the cycle here so i need to make major changes to my portfolios which means selling a load of stuff and buying a load of other stuff and when these big asset managers are doing big kind of portfolio rotations then these big trades are being facilitated through the big investment banks so this is trade flow and this is how the banks make money they facilitate these trades for their buy side institution clients Um, so when things settle down and they're calm dare I say, when things are a bit dull, you know, which is the case the last three months. I mean, it's you check out the VIX, it is way down, right? That's a just a volatility index. So it's just, it's like what we've been saying for the last few weeks, what recession just hasn't, just hasn't come and isn't coming. And so actually, people are just happy to just let this big tech rally just continue to, to grind higher. And so there's been a lot less trade volumes, which equals a lot less revenues for these trading floors. So it's not surprising. No, and maybe just back to Stephen's point about the banking side. Yeah, these numbers are down, but it's like actually not too bad relative to others. So context is key as ever. And I remember being in a restaurant with you, Piers, maybe about four months ago. Okay. Maybe, maybe longer. Maybe this is when all the S- SVB stuff was going on. And I remember uh, in between the main course and dessert, there were a few murmurs of the VIX mentioned at the time. <laughs> Have you seen that? Did you see the VIX last night? And yeah. that was it's the opposite scenario when it was exploding at the time. That, that was the, off the Silicon Valley Bank news. Yeah. That was the one big uh, volatility pop of the year. And it lasted. And that was the short moment, week. basically. It lasted a week. <laughs> and then look, we've had we've had what 26, 27 weeks of the year. And for one week, there was a little bit of action on the volatility side, and then that's that's yeah. it. So when so when you said that in the restaurant, my point being that's when I went short fix. And now you've just said what you've just said, that everything's super calm. Now I'm out of my short. So as soon as we're finished, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so so moving on to city. <laughs> Because, uh, Stephen, you said earlier there's some kind of parallels, but I'd like to know what are the parallels with City and what are the differences? Uh, I did read some, some, a couple of things as well about them being the second largest credit card issuer and customers are still borrowing, but elements in your mind where there's similarities and, and differences. Yeah, so I, I think you would probably you would probably look to Citigroup and put them roughly in the same category as big global banks that are too big to fail, <laughs> if we're going to be as, as kind of generic as, as that. But once you scratch beneath the surface, I think the difference between JP Morgan and Citigroup becomes really apparent. First things first, post-2008, Citigroup have had a really, really rough ride of it um, and have been in the process of trying to straighten their strategy, straighten their cost base. And this earnings report is a real reflection of them still trying to figure it out, figure out who they want to be as a bank, what they want to be as a bank, where they want to be focusing on. And I think it's really important. I was just looking at all of the earnings presentations before the call. It's really important to see not necessarily what's said, but the order in which it's said for these different banks. And it's interesting that on the earnings presentation for Citigroup, page one was a bunch of high-level financials. Page two was... Uh, a load of commentary saying this is how we are working towards our strategic turnaround plan. And it talked about things such as 
redundancies and reorganization and uh, voluntary redundancies and things like that on page two. So they're obviously thinking to themselves, all right, the market wants to know that we are on track with the longer vision. JP Morgan, things are all singing, you know, and all dancing. So it's in a very, very different place. And it's also, it had a pretty bad earnings, earnings report, although it did beat expectations. So net income fell 6%, um, although earnings per share were above expectations. Revenue fell, but again, ex above expectations. S expenses up 9%, driven by severance packages and, and, the, and the costly restructuring of the organization. Good news, as you say, on, the, on credit cards and on more of the retail side of banking. But from a investment banking perspective, from a global banking and markets perspective, the numbers are way, way off. So if you think about the health and the strength and the certainty of these two big beasts, you've got to look at JP Morgan just crushing it and City still fishing around for a little bit of identity. It's, it's, it's not yet found its way post 2008, which is you know, 15 years ago now. So it's a, yeah, it was a really interesting compare and contrast maybe to uh, to JP Morgan. Yeah, there was an interesting comment from the City CEO uh, who said that markets, so it commented on both markets and investment banking. So on the market side, revenues were down from a strong second quarter last year as clients stood on the sidelines starting in April while the US debt limit played out. So she's blaming the... That participants were sitting on the sidelines for a period, and that was a lost amount of revenue. Then in banking, that the long-awaited rebound in investment banking is yet to materialize, making for a disappointing quarter. So she's on the glass half empty side, Stephen, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> I mean, CEOs tend to try and massage and maybe talk their own game and say, you know, and try and put as as, as positive a spin as possible. So this is this is pretty brutal. And it's it's fair that investment banking has been down, but not all investment bank teams have struggled. You know, so if you look to different parts of the world, I was looking at um, UBS in APAC and its deal volume in terms of M and A deal volumes up one hundred seventy two percent this year. <laughs> so, so not everyone is feeling quite the pain. So, if you kind of if you use the excuse of a of a uh, cyclical downturn as a reason to not you know to not try <laughs> as an excuse to not perform better, then you know maybe hard words need to be said in the teams. Cool. And then, Piers, anything on City, or should we move to to Wells Fargo? Well, when you said the City CEO. Um, mm. Do you know who that is? Uh, I know you Jane, mentioned Jane Fraser, is it? Yeah, Jane, well, I might just mention her because I think she's one of, obviously, City, one of the biggest banks. Um, I don't think she's that well known yet. She has been, I thought she'd been in the job for less, she's been in the job for two years, actually. Oh, no, March 2021. Um, I thought it had been a shorter period of time than that. But um, but anyway, yeah, she's um, obviously... Uh, I think she's. I think I'm right in saying the first female CEO at the big, the big giant financials, which is obviously great to see. She's uh, Scottish, did you know? Um, Crazy, but shout yeah. out, shout out to her. But yeah, I mean, I, the only thing I remember about City, like when you were talking about the financial crisis, I mean, going back to that moment, um, I do remember sixth of March, two thousand and nine which is when the day that City, I mean, literally almost went bankrupt. I mean, their share price dropped below $1 and they literally almost ceased to exist. And so they clambered out of that black hole. Now, during that period, of course, JP Morgan fared a lot better and were way stronger. I mean, they got forced to buy Bear Stearns, which was a bit of a well, and so so I guess my point is JP Morgan would the bank the government were going to to make sure other institutions weren't collapsing. Citigroup were not on that list because they were basically collapsing themselves. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting that 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 is still impacting them, you know, 15 years on. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. She's actually been at City since 2004. So she would have been within the okay. mix over that period. Yeah. Um, 2019, she was named president of Citigroup and CEO of its consumer banking division. And then she came in in SEP 2020, replacing Michael Corbett. Part of your alumni, Stephen, you have to tap her up and get her on the show. She's Cambridge, uh, Girton College, ah, uh, and then Harvard really Business good. School. So yeah, well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't get, I didn't get as far as the latter, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what, what CEO of Citigroup? <laughs> no, not yet. There's still time. Yeah, I mean, just just on that just on that point. That's just a very. It's just quite an interesting one in terms of where banks pick their successors. You know, where where banks pick their next leaders. It often says a lot about the direction mm-hmm. that the bank's board wants to take the business. And if that's ex CEO of the retail bank within City, then I think right. that's a pretty clear move pretty clear signal that that's where City's going to be focusing its strategic effort over the next few years. Yeah, and just final point, in that report, their earnings report, it was their personal banking and their wealth management divisions that probably out of everything performed the best. Both were up about 6% um, year on year, um, coming in at about 6.4 billion. Um, So, yeah, makes sense. Well, let's go to, to Wells Fargo. And again, you said earlier that um, although we've just discussed how how different the circumstances are for City to JP, but from a business and proposition, I guess from the products, the services they're doing fairly similar. Is Wells different then? If someone could elaborate, uh, and, I, and I know in the mortgage market and so on, how are they different in terms of being a lender, I guess? And is their business more structured around the lending side? It's a bit more of a normal bank, isn't it? It's a bit more of a commercial normal non-investment bank where net interest income and products related to corporate and commercial banking rule the day. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge bank in terms of deposit base, in terms of um, loan book. It's, it's one of the largest in the world, but it probably doesn't get the headlines that the Goldman Sachs is, albeit smaller from a personnel perspective, uh, but all the JP Morgans would get. But it is had Wells Fargo, mainly US based, although you know increasingly international, has been over the last fifteen years. It's had another brilliant quarter, and I think because it's so exposed to its loan book, you know, net interest income thirteen point two billion, twenty nine percent jump. Its net income fifty seven percent up for the quarter. It's not bad, is it? Earnings per share one twenty five, one dollar twenty five versus. $1.16, smashing earnings ec- estimates, 20.53 uh, billion of revenue versus 20 billion expected. You know, so this this is again, we're talking about this sweet spot. I just want to, I just want to call out the CEO's uh Charlie Shaft's comment. Um, so our strong net interest income continued to benefit from higher interest rates, and we fo- focus on uh controlling expenses. As expected, net loan charge-offs or kind of loan write-downs increased in the first quarter, but consumer charge-offs continued to deteriorate modestly. We expect commercial charge-offs to increase, but we haven't seen it yet. So it's kind of like, all right, you want that situation where your net interest income is flying, but the pain, the pain that is supposed to be felt through rate rises through the economy has not yet happened. And as, you, as you've said on the pod over the, net, over the last few weeks, Will it happen? So it seems to be again. You're making you're making hay when the sun is shining, because these write downs that usually put a drag on your net interest income, we're not seeing them. Provisions are going up. I there is the expectation that there will be more in the future, but they're not really getting tapped. So it's it's you know, it's an interesting one at the moment. I think I'm a bit more worried about the forward looking picture for well. Mm. Um, just because, you know, being being a more of a traditional bank, they are more dependent on those. Well, they got more exposure to, let's say, things like the commercial real estate um, market. And look, there is sat there a San Franciscan based bank. I don't know what they're obviously a global bank, so I don't know what their the proportion of their commercial real estate book is in the San Francisco area. I imagine a small percentage, but they've probably got a bigger exposure to san francisco than any other bank the reason i just 
say is San Francisco is thought to be right at the top of that sort of list of regions that are most at risk of a, like a com commercial real estate sort of collapse. And obviously there's two, there's a double whammy with the commercial real estate side of things where you've got interest rates super high and jumping fast. And then also, of course, the post-COVID hybrid working model, just meaning naturally demand, you know, is, is softening as well. So yeah, I think the going forward with all of these banks, really, it's the loan provisions or the loan default provisions, I should say, that's the amount of money they're kind of setting aside now to pay for defaults on loans in the future. And obviously, that's a forecast, right? They're predicting how many defaults they might see. And I think what you're going to see is that's going to steadily rise. But back to the original point, maybe it's not going to be as bad as we thought. But and, and 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 this seems, you know. So I'm just looking at this quote. You know, we we have made a, an additional 949 million increase in the allowance for credit losses, pr uh, primarily in the commercial real estate um, uh, space. So they're obviously they're obviously kind of factoring this in. Yeah. Does this? Here's you obviously around in 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 08. Does <laughs> does this does this feel very very different in, in terms of you know a normal business cycle slowdown and recession as opposed to oh my gosh there's all of these things happening and we haven't factored them in there's no provisions and you know what what yeah, are the differences is, that you feel i don't know this, this feels very it's almost like in slow motion this one yeah. and uh i mean i mean i guess going back to the crisis in 2008 and 2009 there was a decent um interest rate hiking cycle going into that crisis so thinking about us rates if memory serves me right us rates went from about two percent to six percent from 2004 to 2007 okay so a decent increase um, but it was much slower um so but an increase nonetheless so these banks did have this uptick in net interest income, but there was not there was nothing on the horizon to start preparing for. Right, we weren't back then. We weren't going. Oh my God, rates are so high and the inflation's through the roof. Inflation wasn't high at all, and so we weren't thinking. Right, let's prepare for recession. We were thinking there isn't going to be a recession, and then bang, it just we literally fell off a cliff. I think this time it's very much the opposite, where we're pre preparing for a recession that's actually just not coming. Um, so yeah, the, I think the differences are very stark. And yeah, banks are certainly much better prepared. A recession that is not coming. Famous last words here <laughs> on the pod. We're talking One, US here. But, uh, <laughs> thing, I just wanted to flag maybe for you, Stephen, there was an article that came out on Bloomberg yesterday. And you, there's been quite a lot of headlines around Wells Fargo being quite aggressive in hiring in the IB space. And the, the article yesterday on Bloomberg was saying that Wells Fargo have hired a couple of M&A bankers from Barclays and they're pinching them from Citigroup <laughs> of all places as well, maybe because of, as you've described, the situation there. But so Tom Drake is one of these people. He's joining the San Fran-based bank, Wells Fargo, from Barclays as an MD, focusing on healthcare services. So I guess the sectors might be meaningful here for you. Healthcare and medical technology deals is what he specializes in. And then the other chap, Chris Norman, is joining as well. For, and that he comes from Citigroup's technology M&A group. So it's tech and healthcare they're pinching at the moment. Is that, is that meaningful or not? I guess it just I guess it just makes sense, doesn't it? And and I think maybe you can tie that into Piers's earlier comment. If if you feel like the going is good at the moment, but you may be slightly overexposed to a particular part of, uh, you know, a particular loan book within a particular market, i.e. commercial real estate. Maybe, maybe this is the time to pick up some smart bankers. I mean, they're San Francisco based, so technology makes sense. Healthcare probably makes sense as well. Pick up some smart bankers in this space when other, when other organizations, other banks like Barclays and City, which are very heavily exposed, to the investment banking downturn, need to shift and need to get rid of some people. So it's 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 a kind of classic trade. Um, whether whether it works out, whether Wells Fargo had the distribution 
the network, the, um, the institutional expertise and the reputation to nab a bunch of bankers and then suddenly become the, the go-to. You know, you've got to take on Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan and, and Goldman Sachs if you're going to get there. Yeah, so so Drake and Norman, they're going to report into a chap called David Dinunzio. I, I think that's how you said it. <laughs> that yeah. guy. Um, so they're going to report to him and a person called Jeff Hogan. And these two are the co-heads of global MA at Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo pinched Hogan from MS recently. And Tom Lawler has also been um hired from Credit Suisse. They've picked him up in the in the whole debacle that's happened there. And he's going to focus on real estate, uh, gaming and lodging MA. So it feels like they're being quite aggressive here in this space at the right time, I guess. Didn't they move into the top 10 um, yeah. on deal volume? I can't remember. Was it in quarter one or maybe it was in 2022 overall, which was like the first time they'd been in the top 10 of the IBD league. Well, since I can ever remember, but um, just talking about Credit Suisse, there was an article in the FT today actually about um, 120 Credit Suisse bankers of um, jumped ship uh, for obvious reasons. And it's actually Deutsche Bank that have been picking up more than any. So 40 of the 120 have gone to Deutsche Bank. 25 of them went to Jefferies. 20 went to Santander. In fact, one of those 20 is a friend of mine. Uh, so I can definitely attest to that direction of, of travel. Um, yeah, so Santander actually are another, I think in some ways similar to Wells Fargo, where they're using this downturn in IBD plus specific cases like Credit Suisse, where they're looking to try and pick up some bankers, just increase that side of their business, maybe some sector specialization to bring a bit more diversity. And, and Stephen, what does a bankers um, in in the senior senior part of their career, what does it tend to look like when they move like this? Is it quite common to jump and move from bank to bank? What's like the normal time horizon of an of an MD in one of these senior positions? Or is that not such a thing? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, uh, I don't know whether there's a there's a kind of rule book for it, but I guess if <laughs> you're thinking as these as these people get more and more senior as they move into the md realm again the pyramid becomes shorter uh, becomes steeper there are less places that you can possibly move to you've made a lot of money so at this point it's kind of retirement and non-executive directorships uh if you're not going to kind of continue to move on up into that uh up into that into the top of the pyramid making a lateral move but as we know that's incredibly expensive. That can be incredibly expensive, you know. So Wells Fargo are not. You know, I, I would love to know what they're paying for some of these bankers because it it, it won't be cheap. Um, and also, if you've been at a bank, you know these banks are they have their own institutional memory and their own culture. If you've been, and a lot of these bankers would have been with the same bank for 15, 20 years, to take a shift and go from being you know, a belt and braces bank into a more tech focused bank or whatever it might be. I think that's going to be quite hard when you're relatively ingrained in an institution. So, you know, there's a, there's a number of things to consider. There's not as much movement, obviously, as, as, as there would be slightly further down. OK, well, then final one. Let's go to BlackRock. Markets actually are open now on Wall Street. So I was just trying to see if I can clock what the percentages are. Pre-market, BlackRock were up about a percent comparative to JP, which are up nearly 3%. So the BlackRock numbers are always pretty big when they start talking about things like assets under management. But from a quick scan of the initial numbers as they came out, um, well, just going off the top, the Q2 adjusted EPS, $9.28, uh, far exceeded expectations at eight forty six. dollars Revenues, $4.46 billion. That was broadly in line with expectations of $4.47. Uh, net inflows, topped 80 billion. However, that was actually short. Uh, estimates on the street were for 81. And they did note that cash management products had inflows of $23 billion as investors flocking to take advantage of this interest rate environment. So anything there um, that really stood out for either of you? I mean, I think it's a, it's a bit more straightforward with asset managers. You know, ultimately, their top line revenue really is a well, 
is in large part a function of just how well markets are doing. Just And that's just because it's about fees generated from assets under management. And as the value of the assets under management change, well, then obviously your fees change, your revenues change, right? And we've obviously had a great first half of the year. Well, I know we talked about a narrow rally, but obviously the big tech giants have just had a stormer, which has meant their assets under management has gone up. And so it's up to 9.4 trillion. So obviously they charge, you know, the dollar fees for that is more, right? So that that's one thing. I mean, I do think, yeah, and maybe just to add, actually, so their revenue overall is is still down on, so on a year-on-year basis, their revenue is negative. Um, it's down 1%. And that's, again, just a function of where markets are. Um, I mean, go back 12 months and their assets under management was north of 10 trillion. Um, it dropped sharply below 9 trillion. I can't even remember where we got to. Um, at the start of this year when it kind of bottomed out, but now we're back up to 9.4. So, you know, I think on, on the one hand, it's a bit easier to kind of decipher and, and forecast, I would say, um, these revenues. But so if, if I'm an investor, if I'm an investor in BlackRock or if I'm an investor in publicly listed asset managers, do I kind of just discount, obviously, in, uh, revenue rises in line with assets under management or the increase in the value of the assets that are already under management. Do I just discount that as just, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily smart. Uh, it's not, it's kind of, it's not necessarily the edge that this asset manager has, especially one that is so ETF focused right. and index focused, right? You know, yeah. six and a half trillion of their nine trillion. I don't right. know if I'm celebrating an increase in AUM and fees resulting from that. It's just what you know, they haven't done anything special, right? <laughs> well, they've got the products for the masses. So you said they haven't done anything special, but they've actually nailed the product that has generated the most amount of inflows of any other product on the planet for the last decade, which is basically stock ETFs. Mm. So I guess from a product point of view, they were first and they that first mover advantage has always been in their back pocket. Yeah, and you would have, yeah. I was just going to add just on that point, there was a comment from Larry Fink, who's the CEO, and he said specifically what you've just said, which is, because I know you and Larry are pals, and so what you came out of the statement earlier today was that our platform as a service strategy powered by strong performance is leading to clients consolidating more of their portfolios with BlackRock. So yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. There's another. Yeah. I mean, what I would say also is, right. Obviously, on, on one level, it's just all right. Stock indexes has gone up, more assets under management, more revenue. Happy days. But underneath that, they do have this thing called. They specifically talked about their Aladdin risk management system, which is then like like this is different, right? These are these are other products and very tech orientated products that. You know, they've been working on for years and years and years and are really starting to build to become, you know, actually something a bit more meaningful in terms of the proportion of their revenue. But that so the Aladdin risk management system revenues and, and from other technology services, that was up eight percent. So whilst net overall their revenues down one percent, that part of their business is up eight percent. So that clocked in at 359 million now, um, you know, which is starting to get um, pretty interesting. Um, and yeah, they said, uh, Larry Fink said their 25 largest clients had given BlackRock a larger share of their spending over the last five years on these kind of tech, you know, risk management type type products. So their, their technology arm, um, you know, is really has, has probably been best in class because you've seen other asset managers really suffer a lot more um, because they're that, that, that kind of tech product bit piece if you like just isn't isn't as strong yeah and there was an equity analyst in the ft on the back of this who kind of encapsulated that that thinking uh, he wrote that they've built a better mouse trap in terms of having better technology and options across all the asset classes well look i mean 
so calling it platform as a service, you know, suggests that they are trying to get into the tech speak. And I don't know if you've been to BlackRock's offices in, in London recently, <laughs> but it is, it's like, it's like a tech startup. You, you know, they're all wearing button down shirts and sipping their lattes. It's, it doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like when you go into Schroeder's or something like that. It feels flat, very, very flat different. Flat whites, isn't it? Flat whites. Flat, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. Not with your times. Um, but <laughs> But yeah, the, the last the last thing I want to say about these numbers um, is just in terms of those inflows of 80 billion, you mentioned 23 billion in cash management are actually net outflows in equities. So even though fees from assets under management driven by the equity rally um, have increased, there's been 4.3 billion of outflows and 44 billion of inflows in fixed income. So just in terms of where you know, where the money is going, that's quite a, quite an interesting kind of signal as to where people see the future. Right. And that, that's what I mentioned earlier, right? This is where people with cash in deposit accounts at banks earning no interest whatsoever. Well, this is where it's going, right? They're pulling it out. And so this goes back to the point about being the biggest and having a good set of products. And a good platform, it's easy to kind of just get onboarded. So, yeah, if you've got some cash you want to generate more return from, well, I'll take it out of my account. Where am I going to put it? Well, BlackRock. Let's start with them. They're the number one. And then obviously you start with them and then you probably just end with them as well. And you just stick your money there. Okay, cool. Well, look, let's, let's look to just bring everything together and talk a little bit about the market right now. I mentioned earlier, we've just gone through the open on the street. I'm not sure if either of you have got your charts up, but US equities have just popped Nas to the upside through the open. Um, the NASDAQ is NASDAQ's ripped, feeling fine on a Friday here. And actually, I was just looking at the NASDAQ on a daily chart. I mean, it's the highest going back to the beginning of 2022 right now. And there's a really... I think Wednesday's CPI saw the price really break quite a key long level of resistance, which was holding the price action for recent weeks, but by de facto then this year, 2023, and it was capping some of the, the price activity we had through March and a retest in, in late, Mar uh, late March, April of last year. So technically, looks quite bullish, Piers. I mean, perhaps we could just also layer in firstly the reasons why and obviously that inflation number was really important this week yeah so this is markets and particularly tech uh still leading um but it's about a reducing risk of a bad recession so a hard land that we talk about hard landing and soft landing right which is just a description of how bad a recession is when you're on that downward leg of the cycle and what's happened because of Wednesday's inflation data, the risks of a hard landing have gone down and the probability of therefore a soft landing has gone up. And I guess you might even want to put in the category of a, a probability of no recession at all um, has gone up. So this is about the inflation data, which is of course, of course has driven everything for the last two years and is the entire reason why the central banks have um, ramped up interest rates so quickly and the key reading was on the core inflation print for the month of june uh, came in well below expectation and came in at 4.8 percent um which just indicates that inflation not only because well i guess it's been trending down for a while right but that downtrend's just sped up so we are accelerating back towards two percent at a faster rate than we thought. So it just means that the Fed, I think if you look at rate probabilities, I think it's still the case that markets are pricing in a rate hike from the Fed in two weeks, 25 basis points. But actually, it's beginning to look like that might be it. So we're like one more hike and done. So, so yeah, the peak of the interest rate hiking cycle being revised down. And then maybe, yeah, rates don't stay as high for longer. If inflation is going to return back to normal fast, then, yeah, this, this, is a, this is quite a pivotal moment, perhaps, in that whole debate about are we going to get a recession? Are we not? Are the mm. Fed going to carry on hiking? Are they not? So, yes, I add some percentages there. So the probability of the hike uh, on the 26th of July, next FMC meeting, is still 95%. So pretty much hasn't altered at all. However, 
the probability of end of year, which was priced for another step up, as you said, that's now decreased to 18%. And just sitting at the then 25 extra, which would take us to five and a quarter to five and a half federal funds rate, that's at 62%. So yeah, it's this, it's it's the one and done as far as the market is concerned for now. I would say now till December is a lifetime, of course. Um, in terms of percentages, just just having a look, Nvidia is up twelve percent on the week. Uh, Meta is up eight. Google's up five. Uh, these aren't small companies here, so it's definitely got got some decent pace to it. One question then, maybe to wrap, the British pound, peers. That's that's also well and above through 130 uh, at this point in time, just because I want to talk in your mind about the contrast between some of the data we've seen. This week we had GDP was a contraction, but only 0.1 against 0.3 expected. So the resilience, the resiliency, despite the coronation of King Charles, God bless the King, he, the economy is still going. And wages are still going up, it was shown in the latest jobs data this week. So further yeah. fueling this idea of UK rates going even higher. So anything there that you see with the... Well, and Rishi signing off on a 6% pay deal for the public sector. You know, all of this stuff feeds into the very clear evidence that the inflation problem in the UK is has definitely not gone away like it is doing in the US. The US are on a great trend here on inflation. Unfortunately, the UK, it's still, not only is it not coming down, it's still going up at a core inflation level. Um, that pound against the dollar charts, quite extraordinary. Like just in, in two weeks, less than, basically in one week, it's gone from 127 to one to above 131. I mean, I can't, I can't describe how big a move that is in such a short space of time. Now, a lot of this is dollar related, right? The dollar is weakening rather than the pound strengthening. So the dollar is devaluing because of that inflation data indicating the Fed are done. Whereas the Bank of England, they're going to have to carry on hiking for God knows how long here. So you've got all of a sudden quite a divergence again in the interest rate expectations between what the Bank of England will do, carry on hiking, and what the Fed will do stop and so that's leading to the pound appreciating and and the dollar sort of devaluing so yeah quite an amazing move i have to say okay cool well look just to wrap two things i wanted to say for one yeah given the breakdown of what's being described for some people might have been quite a lot to absorb so if you jump on the amplify me youtube channel steven did a awesome series of explainers that are like two to three minute long videos with animations and slides that explain some of these things like what's the difference between the investment bank and the commercial bank and the different divisions and so on. Uh, and when you see that visual cue, maybe it will help just pull the pieces of the puzzle together of what we've discussed for anyone where, you know, this is might be a new subject to you. So do check that out. Uh, and then also what I'll do is I'll post myself on LinkedIn this weekend, some of the earning statements where we've you know, gathered some of this information we've discussed. Um, it's not that it's um, difficult to find. You just got to know where to look. And so I'll give you a little walkthrough for any curious minded students or investors who want to know how to find these metrics. Uh, I'll give you some step-by-step uh, advice on there as well. So feel free to, to check out Amplify Me uh, and then feel free to connect with all three of us on LinkedIn. We'd love to um, to speak with you. But thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Ed. Catch you later. Thank you. All right. Take care.